remain standing for the scripture reading. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people, evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though, though a mighty arm surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I'm attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in His temple. For He will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in His sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Above, uh, then I will hold my head high above my enemies uh, who surround me. At his sanctuary, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. Hear me as I pray, O Lord, be merciful and answer me. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. Do not turn your back from me. Do not reject your servant in anger. You have always been my helper. Do not leave me now. Don't abandon me, O God, my salvation. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Teach me how to live, O Lord. Lead me along the right paths, for my enemies are awaiting me. Do not let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things I've never done. In every breath, they threaten me with violence. Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I'm here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave, be courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. You may be seated. I know that asking uh, you to stand even more sometimes, uh, especially for a long scripture reading, but isn't that a beautiful one? Psalm 27 has so much within just that short little passage that is just impressive. And it really calms your soul. It kind of sets things in perspective. It sets things right. And at the onset of that passage, he starts with, The Lord is my light. The Lord is my light. What does it mean to say, The Lord is my light? When my dad was a caretaker out at Camp Blue Haven, he befriended one of the neighbors there. It was across the valley. It ended up being several miles from there. But whenever you're talking about in the hills, uh, in, the, in the foothills and mountains, a neighbor is just fine if they're on the other side of the mountain. But he befriended one of these neighbors. And it, this neighbor ended up telling him about a copper mine that was on this piece of land. My dad, being the uh, local history connoisseur that he is, one, just asked him, can I go see it sometime? So finally the date was set that he was able to go and explore this copper mine. Well, that eventually led to the inauguration of a new hike for the uh, Camp Blue Haven uh, campers. And it was the Copper Mine hike. Uh, I know they come up with great names for these things. But the Copper Mine hike, well, I, I was able to go on one of the very first hikes that, uh, with campers uh, there with my dad. And it was impressive. We had to take a little bus over to a certain area, hike for a little bit up to it. And then... As you would imagine, it's copper mine. It's a hole that is dug that is a rectangle, and it's straight back into the mountain for a uh, ways. I can't remember how many feet it is. It's several, uh, you know, several tens of feet in there, maybe 50, 70 feet. You have to go through, wade through some water, and, and you come to a clearing right there, and you can see the, the green copper vein that they were mining, a little bit of that. And then it takes a quick turn. And it turns around, and, and they come, as you turn, it comes into this bigger... Uh, not huge by any standard, but a bigger room, and it goes a little bit back. They're trying to follow this vein of copper around, and it's a completely man-made place. But it was fun for these kids to explore because you had to have a flashlight. Go figure. It makes kind of sense, especially when you think of where we're going. No light there. One of the things my dad would do is he would gather everybody in that little room past the first turn, and he'd have everyone get quiet, which was hard to do in a closed space with a bunch of, you know, kids. Tell them to get quiet, and he would turn, ask everyone to turn off their flashlights. Now, they were always the laggers, the ones that were, wanted to be the last one to turn their light off, but as soon as that last light was off, darkness. I don't know if you've ever been in complete darkness, 
uh, somewhat like that. I don't know if you've been to one of these caverns, whether it be Carlsbad Caverns, which I'm sure Benny and Pam know a little bit about, or the uh, Alabaster Caverns in Oklahoma, or uh, Cave of the Winds in Colorado Springs, or plenty of others. They're all over the country. And that is one of the things that they like to do, is turn off the lights so that you can experience what we might call pitch black. So my dad would have all the campers turn off their lights, and you'd always have the, the usual screamer, which echoed and was loud. But he'd get them all quiet again and, and take this opportunity to teach these kids, tell them about dark and light. And after a little bit, your eyes, they don't get used to it. I don't think you get used to pitch blackness. But your eyes, your pupils, kind of they dilate and you wait. And whenever that first light comes on, no matter how small it is, boy, you see it. You see that light. It enabled us to see. No matter how small it is, it could just be a little, little tiny flashlight, but all of a sudden you start recognizing shapes. And you start recognizing as your eyes grow uh, adjusting to that light, you see more and more. And in fact, then all of a sudden there is a calmness that we get when things are in the light. It enables us to see. Light enables us to see all the beautiful colors that, that God created in our world. It enables to see, uh, us to see the loved ones that are both close and even far away. Light enables us to look out and see creation. It enables us to go and have this sense of security, knowing that we can see the path ahead. We can see our surroundings. We can see things. We always want to be near light. In fact, just think of how many kids sleep with a nightlight on. Well, for that matter, how many adults sleep with a nightlight on as well. We try to protect our houses by leaving on a porch light or having security lights around the house because we think light will deter crime. Because most crime happens in the dark. Most bad things happen in the dark. And so we want light. I want you to think about light for just a little bit longer. It's perhaps the most important thing we have in this world. I want you to just try to imagine a life without the sun, moon, stars, I mean, not to mention that the sun gives, gives plants their energy to create oxygen, so even if it's not for seeing, we couldn't go without the sun uh, because of oxygen. But there's a lot going on with this light. In fact, Genesis 1.1, what is the first thing we read that God spoke into existence? In the beginning was God, and, uh, and God spoke, let there be light. Now notice, this light is not the sun, moon, and stars. That comes in a later day of creation. Just wrap your mind around that. What in the world did God create at that point? What did He speak into existence? What did He speak into that world that all of a sudden now was light? We're going to come back to that. There's more going on with this understanding of light. Just grab hold of it and and join me on this journey of understanding what God is like, because uh, David starts this psalm. The Lord is my light. The actual word there is Jehovah or. Jehovah or. The Lord is my light. God, he is saying, is our source of life. He is our all in all. Without God, we are nothing. We can't see and we can't be. Because God is is the light and the life force within us. uh, Jesus even says in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. There's a story that's uh, attributed to Albert Einstein. And uh, you've got to know that uh, for one, it's not true. If you've seen this story passed around through your emails and whatnot else, you need to be careful of, of what all you believe. It's attributed to Albert Einstein, but he didn't say it, and in fact, some of the thoughts uh, might be debatable, but it serves as a good modern-day parable. The story goes something like this. A professor at a university uh, was wanting to challenge his students, and especially wanted to challenge them on their belief in God. And so he asked the students, did, did God create everything that exists well one of the students that you know knew the genesis story knows in genesis 1 1 oh yeah god created everything so the professor then asked well did is there evil in this world 
well, yeah, then, then you're saying that God created evil. Well, student, uh, well, I'm not. I, I, he didn't really know what to say. He's been caught because that is a great conundrum for people to put Christians in. Did God create evil? Well, one of the other students said, Professor, may I speak up? He said, yeah, sure. He said, uh, the student asked the professor, does cold exist? Well, the professor says, well, well, of course cold exists. Have you never wanted to put on a coat because you were cold? Have you never been in a place where you wanted to turn the temperature up? Of course cold exists. To which the student said, in fact, sir, cold does not exist. According to the laws of physics, we consider cold to be, in reality, the absence of heat. And he goes on that every body or object is susceptible uh, to transmit energy. And we that energy that is transmitted is measured in heat that it provides. And every body of matter transmits some sort of energy. We have a thing that's called absolute zero, which is negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit. Talk about cold. It's the total absence of heat in which all matter becomes incapable of reaction at that temperature. The thing is, cold doesn't exist, he told his professor. Only the absence of heat. We created this word of cold to explain when there is no heat. And then he asked another question of the professor. He says, does darkness exist? Well, the professor, of course darkness exists. You want me to turn off the light and show you darkness? Have you never been in a cave? Have you never been in one of those places? To which the the student said, once again, sir, you are wrong. Darkness does not exist either. Darkness, in reality, is the absence of light. Light we can study, but not darkness. He says, in fact, Newton's prism, we can use it to break a white light into many colors and see light. Light in all its glory, all the different wavelengths, but you cannot measure darkness. There is no way of making something that is dark, darker. You can only make it have less light. That is the scale in which it's measured of. On darkness is only a term that we have created to, ex- uh, to explain when there is no light present or limited light present. So finally... The young student said, Sir, does, does evil exist? So the professor said, Well, yes, I'm going to stick with my answer. Evil does exist. Have you not seen all the violence in this world, all the crime committed, all the bad things that happen? To which the student replied, Once again, sir, you are wrong. Evil does not exist, at least unto itself. Evil is simply the absence of God. That we have created this word to explain when there is not God. It's like cold when there's no heat or darkness when there's no light. Now, that's a great story of understanding. There are a few theological implications that I'm not going to jump into that that put us in a little bit of a conundrum, uh, to be honest. But the point is true, though. The point is true. There is no such thing as cold. There is no such thing as darkness. Only the absence of the things that we can measure, the things that we can relate to and understand. And so in that respect, I believe everything that that said about God, that evil is the absence of God. And the only way to measure that is how much God is in. But to understand light... We do have to look at its reverse. We have to take a look at what uh, of the nature of darkness as it compares to Jehovah or. And so first thing it says God is light. In him is no darkness. In fact, John, 1 John 1, 5 through 7, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. If we claim we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. God is pure light. Isn't that what that verse was saying? And in fact, if you don't believe me, if you ever get a chance, go ask Saul, who later became Paul. 
I think he'll tell you that God is pure light. You remember his story? He's on the road to Damascus ready to uh, bring uh, captives of Christianity, bring Christians back to Jerusalem for trial. And on his way, he encounters God in the form of Jesus and in the form of, as he says, a bright light. So much so that whenever the light was gone, he could not see. So this is a blind, blinding bright light that Paul or Saul comes in contact with. Have you ever been in one of those... Uh, maybe you've been, you're, you're sleeping one in the morning and, and, and you're just slowly, restfully just waking up. It's nice and dark so you, your eyes can get adjusted to the little light that, that is there. You know those mornings... Those are good mornings uh, that you can just kind of enjoy the, the darkness co- slowly coming in the light. Well, imagine that. Have you ever had someone come in and just flip the light switch on for you? I tell you, that's not cool. That's not nice. Because that, it is not fun to go from darkness to all of a sudden straight up light. And that's what Saul did that day. He was walking in darkness. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he, ex- he came in contact with light, pure light. He came in contact with Jehovah Or, the God of light. You know, as we look around in this world, we, we see a lot of darkness. More so spiritual darkness. People who live in spiritual darkness. So if God is light and in Him is no darkness, what does it say about those people who have spiritual darkness? Well, if Darkness is not something except an explanation of what it has not, that it does not have God, then the people that walk in spiritual darkness don't have God. Yet, I think there's always hope. There's always hope. So the same is true of people who claim to know God, but don't act like it. The people who claim, Lord, Lord, we did all this stuff for you. And he says, turn away from you, me. I do not know you. Because they're full of darkness. Because they don't have the light in them. Matthew extends this a little bit further. In Matthew six twenty two. he says, your eye is the lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, the whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? I love that verse. I love understanding what the eye and the, and the light inside us, but I really like whenever it comes to the end that you say, he says, if the light that you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? What he's saying is, is what if we live in darkness, but we think that is the light, that this is the path, how deep really is, that, is your darkness? Because you're not even looking for the true light. You're completely okay with your little you know, a flashlight. Whereas God wants you to have His. Not His flashlight, but His torch that illuminates everything. John 3.19 says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Light came, but men loved darkness. That is our predicament. But God is light. In Him is no darkness. And so if we love the darkness, if we are children of darkness, we we are not children of light. Because God is light. And in Him is no darkness. But as well, God is light. He exposes the darkness. Ephesians 5, 11 through 14, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed to to the light becomes visible. For it is light that makes everything visible. Paul and Barnabas, they just set off on their way to on, on what we call the first missionary journey. It's Acts 13. They head to the island of Cyprus, which happens to be the home of Barnabas. And they're traveling through Cyprus and, and preaching at the different places. And they meet a Jewish sorcerer named Bar-Jesus. Now, Bar-Jesus is is a false prophet, sure, but don't mistake this. He is legit. He is honestly doing and performing works and miracles and things so much so that the governor is convinced that this man is a spokesman of God. 
So this man has to be somewhat legit. But as they continue on, Paul comes into town. And the governor wants to hear Paul, and as it says here, he wants to hear him because he wants to hear the word of God. Well, this is stepping on Bar Jesus' toes. He's the messenger of the word of God, not this Paul. And so he strives to stop the governor from believing. He tries to stop him from even letting Paul come and speak because he knows there's power in that word. He knows that Paul is preaching about light. And he doesn't want that exposed. And so Paul looks at, at, at him right in the eye. And I love this. You can't make this stuff up. Here's what he says in Scripture. Paul looks at Bar Jesus right in the eye and says, You son of the devil. You didn't know that was in there, did you? He says, you son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, the enemy of all that is good. These are, you know, these are playful words, right? Boy, these are harsh words. Will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hand of punishment upon you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly, mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take him by the hand and lead him. Bar Jesus was exposed for what he was a son of darkness. How fitting a punishment for a son of darkness to have the punishment of blindness. I love how this works, and I love that it just makes a fitting punishment. And because of bar jesus wanting to step in the way and stop the governor from believing it is the very act that causes the governor to believe because of what happened to bar jesus paul is able to preach and the governor of that providence believes you know no matter how dark something might be the light always exposes it the light always exposes darkness If you've been in that cave, if you've been in that deep, dark place, it doesn't matter how tiny the light may be, it always exposes and cuts through the darkness. Paul wasn't afraid then of Bar-Jesus and the darkness that was in him because he knew that the light exposes that darkness. He knew that that's what happens. It shines true and exposes to where there even is no darkness. That's what light does does and for christians then we should not fear evil we should not fear darkness because darkness is taken away with jehovah or with the god of light the darkness uh, definitely knows that god is light and it doesn't want a thing to do with god because the two can't exist together they can't work together In fact, if there is light, there is no darkness, which I guess takes us back to our text. It says, the Lord is my light. Whom shall I fear? With God as our light, we we don't have any need to fear darkness because darkness cannot dwell where He is. And so if the Lord is light, what shall I fear? If the Lord is my light, what am I going to be afraid of? I'm in safety. I'm in security. Because the world is exposed now. The world is exposed. But even more than God just being light to expose the darkness, God is light. He guides and provides direction for me. John 8 verse 12 says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. 2 Corinthians 4 6, For God who said, let let light shine out of darkness. That same God made the light shine in our hearts to give us the light of of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That same God that in Genesis 1-1 spoke light into this dark world, there at the beginning of it all spoke light into our darkness, is the same God that gave us light in the face of Christ that gave us a light that speaks into this world. Jesus became light for us. We can trust in Him to illuminate our path. We can know where to go because Jesus has been there. And Jesus has shown us the way. Not shown us in darkness, but shown us in the light. But without Him, we're groping around in the darkness. 1 John 2, 10 
Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to, be ma- to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. When God is in you, there's light. It illuminates the path, the, in the right path that you need to be going on. This is how God works. This is his plan, is that because God is Jehovah Or, he is the light giver. And what's beautiful about this is it, it shows that we are not the light. We are not the ones that are illuminating. We are only reflecting. What glory does the moon have? Does the, is the moon good by itself? We wouldn't even know or care much about the moon if it weren't for the sun. The whole job the moon has is to reflect the sun for us. And this is powerful, especially for Christians, because we're not the sun. But maybe we're the moon. Maybe we're the moon that gives light into a dark world. Maybe ever so dim. Now, as our light might be, it's still there. Because we're reflecting as much as we can what God has in store. Matthew five fourteen. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither does someone light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We're not the light, but maybe we're more akin to a a mirror even. And I believe that if our lives, the clearer that our lives are to reflect Christ, the brighter our light can be in our life. And the brighter that our light is, the more we are reflecting Jehovah or, and the more people can see because our lives are reflecting His. That is the beauty, that is the nature of light. And so maybe we need to change some of our language. Maybe we don't Think, we shouldn't think, oh, we just live in a dark world. What can we do? When David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? He's saying that whenever I walk into a place, it's not a dark place anymore. It's not a spiritually dark place whenever I enter it because I'm reflecting Jehovah or I'm reflecting the light of the Lord. And so whenever I come into a place, darkness better be scared. Because it was scared of the sun, Christ, Christ is in me. What's darkness got on me then? What's darkness got on you? You are the light of the world. Take comfort in that. Know that you've got a mission. You've got a place that Christ has spoken into and you're not in darkness anymore. And he asks you to reflect his glory. To shine bright. Maybe Rihanna has it right. If it's Rihanna, shine bright like a diamond. Y'all know that? Okay. Maybe she has that right. Maybe that's our goal, is to shine so bright that whenever other people see us, they're not seeing us anymore. They're seeing the light of Christ in this world. So I'm going to ask you this morning, do you have any fear of darkness? Because if you do, you shouldn't. Your fear should be of the Lord and Him alone. We have no reason to fear darkness, so I guess the next question then is if you've got light in you, are you letting it shine? I'm going to ask you this morning to stand up and to let your light shine so forth before men so that they will know His glory. Will you join us this morning as we let our light shine?